you guys shot it. Confirm with them. Put your fish on. Yes, your fish. You want me to pay? message him and say, yeah. you're up first. I figured, you know, honestly, I'm so bad in this strength. How do I message him? Um, there's, there's dotted lines here. And then you can do the message. I'm here, Ned. I can hear you. That was the feedback I gave at the training. Was don't put the dotted lines over the photo. Oh, he disappeared. He disappeared. For those who are remote, can you hear us? Yes, we can. Yes. Hear Great. And this is Kathleen. I'm on now. Good to have you on, Kathleen. Hopefully, you're feeling okay. Not too bad, but it's three thirty in the morning with <laughs> on top of it. So yeah. I'll do the best doing, I right? can. So the dots don't work for me. Open user menu. The dots are not. Yeah, and all, when I do the click, I get clear the menu. But I, I miss you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, see, this is what I get. Reload, save, print. Really? Let me try this. Yeah, see, close user menu. Click it. Just right there, right there. Message. Uh, okay. But that's weird. It throws me off. It's, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> no, no, no. I've mean, given feedback, that feedback that that's really. We've got more people than we know what they're doing. I'm putting my mask on just because I don't want to. Should we get started? Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome. We're going to get started. Welcome to uh, RATS Working Group. Can you guys hear me okay? Can you guys hear me okay? Welcome yes. to the RATS Working Group. Uh, we're going to get started. Um, <clears throat> just uh, pay attention to the note well. Uh, I think everybody, every meeting starts this way, but you know, there are, there are uh, guidelines for you know, how, to, how to behave. Uh, there's code of contact, co conduct, anti-harassment, uh, uh, as well as uh, patent and copyright uh, guidelines that we need to follow. So if you're not familiar with those, please uh, read them so you are familiar with them. Uh, this session is uh, recorded. Uh, just a brief highlight on some of the uh, code of conduct, um, you know, behavior guidelines. Let's, uh, you know, be respectful. Don't uh, make anything personal. It's okay to object to ideas, but not to people. Um, uh, so make it, make it, make your comments and feedback and personal. Um, uh, and again, we're, we're here to provide solutions for the global internet. So that's our guiding uh, principle. And uh, so uh, please, please participate. Uh, um, the, we do have a, a, a plug for the non-com. I don't know, Nancy, do you want to talk yeah, to this? Sure. So um, there are quite a few candidates for different areas uh, and they've actually extended the deadline to provide feedback. So I encourage everybody to do so, so that we can get good area directors as well as the IETF chair. So we've put the link both, you can provide feedback directly by sending email if that's easiest to you on any of the candidates, or you can go directly to the website. The links are there. Okay, we got, uh, we got volunteers to take notes. Thank you for those who volunteered, Hannes and Frank. And um, did we get a, a Zulip watcher? Um, Somebody on Zulip that wants to sort of be able to chime in if there's uh, activity on Zulip. Thanks, Thomas. All right, so our agenda, 
Um, this is what's been posted. We do have a change in the agenda. So uh, we're going to, to flip around the CORIM and UCCS topics. So, uh, but otherwise, I, that, that's the only change that we have to make. Uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, it will depend on when Hank shows up, so. <laughs> so. So Hank will go when he shows up. How about that? <laughs> Anybody object to that agenda bash? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not. It's not what you think. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> exactly. And right. we only do that for one or two of the sessions. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, otherwise, any other agenda bash items, things that we should have on the agenda that we don't. Going once, going twice. Okay. So next up is uh, Yogesh with Karim update. So Hello, and uh, uh, I think we need to present slides. slides yeah. Yeah. So, so Ned's working on bringing up the slides, Yogesh. Yeah. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm going to present what is the work um, being done in the Corim RATS uh, Corim Working Group. Um, the Corim Working Group meets regularly um, every Wednesday, 4, 4 p.m. in the European time. And uh, there's a lot of brainstorm and a lot of activities and work which happens every week. So uh, I'm going to give a brief update of what has happened over the last uh, between ITF 117 and 118. So next slide, please. Yeah. So these are the kind of main points of the presentation where uh, we did tidy up uh, some of the editorial enhancements and then uh, we'll talk about the alignment with uh, RATS endorsement uh, draft, which is published by Dave. Then we will explain the concept of COBOM and how we think it should be, it will be used, followed by some tidy up on extensions. And then we added some more details on the verifier algorithm, which will go into detail and the last bullet just mentions that how active we are. Um, the, there were plenty of contentious issues we resolved. Uh, so nine issues got resolved this uh, between last three months and 26 new issues created uh, on the Corium draft and towards the discussion. So next slide, please. Yeah. So some of the uh, um, some of the enhancements uh, which went in is we have identified that the target enrollment can be associated uh, with some crypto keys, which which uh, the target enrollment gets protected by that. So we added the crypto keys as one of the entities in the measurement values, and um, how, if at all, these needs keys needs to be used for the target enrollment that got clarified. And uh, one of the important things we we added was uh, the authorized by into the measurement map. So basically, measurement map is kind of a, a struct uh, is a map which is used uh, to express any reference values or endorsed values. So the reference value provider or an endorsed endorser uh, supplies um, in, in Corim and Comid the reference values. And it is very important to mention the authority, which can be different than the authority of the overall Corim signer. So um, it's very important then that kind of uh, level of granularity on the on the triples on the endorsement endorsed values and reference value triple the authority needs to be added so this this announcement went in into it in this cycle of the quorum and then uh, we clarified some of the key terms on the appraisal procedure when we do the appraisal of uh, evidence based on uh, supply chain endorsements received from the, um, the reference values and endorsement received from the supply chain so very important discussions there will come in to that a little more detail in the next slide. So next slide, please, yeah. Yes, this uh, basically we, we are just, uh, we our team is looking at the RATS endorsement draft, which is, uh, we have a working group called subsequently from Dave Thaler and uh, 
we are trying to align with the uh, terminologies and very much similar concepts do appear in in the and terminologies do appear in these two drafts like um, uh, the we also have an accepted claim set accepted claim set as part of the appraisal, appraisal procedure and very similar stuff uh, very similar description and terminology appears in uh, rats endorsement from dave uh, that calls the actual state and what we call reference values maps to the reference state and then the most important uh, thing is the conditionally endorsed values so basically conditional endorsed values are endorsements which which pertain to a target environment when it is when it matches reference values given reference values so evidence comes in with a target environment and its reference values when that precise reference values match in the verifier then certain endorsement apply so that matching condition is the requirement criteria and that is the conditional endorsed values uh, i think uh, rats endorsement do talk about that so there is uh, some alignment going on there and then there are identity endorsements as well and yeah and so we simplified the appraisal procedure and i think that, that is going to be aligned with the rats endorsement so yeah next slide please so then we had a, a detailed discussion about um, the concept called concise bill of material that has uh, been more clarified and tidied up so i will i will grow uh, briefly on what exactly we mean by this uh, concise bill of material and then we we will explain a bit more about what discussions went around that so uh, a reference value provider or uh, an endorser provides uh, reference values using comid which are part of corim and there could be multiple of such um, uh, corims from multiple supply chain actors and the verifier may want to apply all of them together because uh, it cannot understand what what co uh, supply chain entities are correlated logically in one uh, and should be applied in a verifier uh, appraisal procedure so cobom provides that mechanism where to means to activate a list of comid and coswit tag identifiers and the, so we defined a concise bom tag structure which contains just a list of comid and coswit tag identities and there is an associated bom identifier known as cobom id and it is important to highlight that um, the corim containing the cobom doesn't need to have the um, comid and coswit actual structures itself they they can be supplied much prior before time from different actors and cobom is just a signal to the verifier to activate those listed tags in the cobom at one point in time so that they can be applied uh, during the uh, appraisal procedure by the verifier so we had a great, great discussion about how uh, how the cobombs would work and so uh, they, we we currently have uh, scaled it down to uh, requirement as no cobom if it's a very simple supply chain where maybe just one corim is enough to supply all the comits and coswits and then that signal itself is enough so cobombs may not be required but likelihood is the use case point c where one cobom is required where multiple actors supply reference values to the verifier and one cobom is issued by a designated authority like an integrator to activate all the tags which were earlier supplied to the verifier through comit you, and coswit yeah your guess you've questions? got a couple people on the queue i don't know if you want to yes take sure now. yes hannes yeah please go ahead yeah i when I saw this slide, I was thinking about um, sort of the overall approach that the document takes. It uh, um, sort of the whole, you have to verify and you want to provision reference values and endorsements into that uh, verifier. And normally uh, the verifier is not kind of a constrained device in any shape or form. It's like a regular web service. And the easiest way you could do that is uh, like you use JSON and, and get the stuff in there and you're done with it. Um, however, you went off and defined everything in Seaboard, which is 
I don't know, uh, makes, uh, makes it more complicated. But then you, in, on this slide, I wasn't quite sure anymore when you even work on a concise bill of material, wouldn't, is that like, how do I, can't I just use existing bill of material formats and not bother with um, coming up with something new? Maybe I'm, I'm missing something here. Maybe you can explain that. So basically this is, uh, this is for the activation context because a verifier can get reference values and endorse values for multiple, uh, multiple appraisal contexts, right? Because um, it, it, it cannot, it may not have the knowledge to distinguish uh, what these quorums apply to which context. So this is just a aiding tool for it to understand that, okay, it will keep all the commits and coswits in, in one side context. And once it receives a cobomb, it applies those to that particular appraisal procedure. So that is, that is the intent basically to, to aid the verifier in evidence appraisal. Basically, this is a kind of a handy tool to activate uh, the context in one single shot. Does yeah, that answer? I, I think I need to let this settle in. Uh, yeah. Not quite sure I yeah. understand it. Uh, Maybe Hank uh, Maybe has Hank something which he can add more. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so actually, I'm here for Hannes and you, Yogesh. Hi, Yogesh. Yeah. Hi. Um, this is Hank. <laughs> so um, why is this small? Um, because the size and the amount of the data in it can be gargantuan. This is a, and this is a true coincident uh, analogy, like with an S-bomb. I knew S-bombs, I have seen S-bombs that are larger than 450 megabytes, but, but that is nonsense. So with these reference values, and when you have these um, endorsements and you have device compositions with, I want to say like 17 types of uh, firmware potentially running on five types of hardware, uh, allowing uh, for a certain set of environment that this because this is a lot of permutation. So, so we keep size small because device complexity is not decreasing currently. So first reason. Second reason is uh, simplicity of appraisal. Um, there are uh, attestation evidence formats that are symmetric to quorum. And when you have evidence that's symmetric, you can do byte compare and super easy verifiers that reduces the burden of appraisal of evidence on the verifier, which potentially has to appraise a large number of devices again, a scalability uh, problem. So this is about the um, compactness and why this is seaborne. Then you have the cobomb, and I, under, I understand this might be not the best name ever, but um, when you have one co-rim, you can not always be sure that you need more. Um, if you have a pyramid and take a stone out of it, was this the top stone? So if there's a co-bomb somewhere or a reference to something, you can check for completeness of co-rim for your device. If you go to a, I want to say, to a website or to a skit service, I don't know. Shameless self-advertisement. Um, then, then the, then the uh, top-level quorum should point to everything else potentially in your configuration of setup of domain of devices that you're using. Uh, what what you need to have a good um, fueled verifier, and this is what this bomb is for, because we realize that with a single quorum. Um, that would then arbitrarily, okay, and this could have an alternative there and here, this becomes super complex. So we up-level that dependency tree, so to speak, into a structure that's called a cobomb. You could call it something else. The name is not relevant, but it is literally a bill of all the manifests uh, that you will need for your product in the end. And it's all its viable states in your environment. That's why it's called cobomb at the moment. We are not tied to that name. It just came natural because it was somehow that concept. It's not an S-bomb, 
S bombs are an entirely different purpose. They are also give you, but this is for trustworthiness. You could say this is a way more precise, way more uh, well structured S bomb that's only for uh, remote attestation purposes to explain attestors to verifiers. And, and, and an entire S bomb would be way more uh, uh, content rich on the software side and way less content rich on the composition of the device side. So do you have like for the for the as you said gigantically large uh, S bombs? Do you, is this do you essentially just create a compressed version of it, or is it a separate? Do you need to make a semantic transformation of it? Because the S bombs already exist from other contexts. Uh, no, this is not S bomb. Just this is, no, no, no. The, the earlier, not this one, but the, the you elaborated. You said before, like these S bombs are gigantically large and has megabytes of size. Uh, and you don't want to, that's why you do the compression to CBOR. But I, wonder, I was wondering whether it's truly a compression. Like you seem to be doing a lot of uh, compression here. Because no. no then okay, I don't uh, understand yeah. at all what you said. Yeah. Okay. Um, as, with, as with the analogy of S bombs, yeah. there can be a lot of reference values and endorsed values here. Yeah. That's the only analogy I made. So, but. So when I was saying that, like, why didn't you use JSON for these things? Because it's easier for web developers to develop this. And this, you said, oh, I, we compress it because it's so large. Uh, right? That's the reason why you didn't yeah. want to use JSON. No, CBOR. You, you didn't want to use JSON and use CBOR because the values are so large. Like, you make an optimization here, and I don't understand yeah. the optimization. Exactly. Reference value typically are hashes. And these are bytes, and they they can't uh, are not represented very well in JSON. Um, also, you need to parse the whole JSON document in order to get at a single value. And sometimes a verifier wants to be efficient and not to do that, and just go to the right place. And so I think Cibo has more features than just being compact. It it, it can be parsed on block even when applied with packed CBOR. And, and I think there's so many benefits in the uh, efficiency for evidence of appraisal and verifiers here that there is it's an obvious choice. And uh, uh, Hannes, I want to add that uh, don't ignore constrained verifiers as well, where you could have a verifier running in trusted execution environment in one, one confidential computing environment and the attester is in the another. So don't disregard that keep that use case also in mind when considering that why CBOR is more relevant. Yeah. Okay, I will, I will reread the document to see whether those are actually these arguments are actually valid towards a premature optimization. Okay, Thomas? Um, relaying uh, um, Kathleen from the Zulip chat, would this fit more with Skit? It seems to be pulling together supply chain details, but I need to read the draft. Uh, it is not, um, well, supplying reference values and endorsements to a verifier is kind of a similar kind of action which Skid does. But here we are talking specifically to uh, the supply chain data which is relevant to the verification of uh, for the appraisal procedure for the verifier. So Cobom is basically a way of um, kind of consolidating the um, elements uh, which are supplied by Corim in one way, means of activation. But yes, there is a connection to SKIT, but it is not exactly SKIT because SKIT is a different trust model and a different uh, requirement altogether. Does that answer, Kathleen? I think what I'm hearing, um, Yogesh, is that you need to have a better explanation for why this is needed and okay. why it should be in rats, not skit. Some examples. Yeah. OK, sure, fair point. I think we need better explanation. But as you can see, the first point, it is up to the verifier's appraisal policy as to whether it wants to use COBOM or not. It's a kind of a. Um, 
helper tool or effectively uh, it is it is there to make the job of or the life of verifier easy because it it is doing appraisal of n number of different types of uh, attesters which are supporting different types of attestation technologies so it will have different types of reference values and this assist it to kind of make the context boundary easier so i think perhaps we we should add more clarification text to what are the relevant um, applicable use cases where this may be required but as as i mentioned it is not a mandatory feature uh, that it has to be there if there are zero one or n co bombs so that's where i would put it next slide please okay you need to keep moving your guess yeah next slide please yeah you're you're over time but go ahead oh, okay my apologies yeah so uh, then we uh, discussed um, and added uh, tidied up the extensions work because um, it was a bit vague which of the entities in the uh, triples can be extended which of the elements in the triples can be extended so we tidied up and uh, we added explicit ex extension sockets into the points where it can be extended and just this slide highlights what is the need for extensions because there may be certain vendor specific requirements or proprietary requirements which needs a variation of the base core im spec and uh, to make keep the specification relevant for all possible future predicted use cases one needs to add um, uh, the mechanism so that one can modify this specification as per their requirement and how to do that or uh, is explained in the next slide please next slide please i i'm still seeing the old slide yeah so we have two types of extension sockets into the base core im schema the, the group choice which uh, is basically lets you extend your maps and the type choice which extend let you extend your existing types and the the groups and types which are extended should be tagged so there is some clarification and tagging work needs to be done in the spec and it is recommended that whenever the extension happens there should be associated core im profile and a document which which documents that spe that specific profile and the extension supported in that and uh, we have a few examples here so from uh, intel core im profile and uh, rats psa core im profile which are the real world examples of how the extensions have been applied and profiles have been documented so next slide please so uh, we further working on the um, evidence appraisal procedure or the algorithm and we have done some progress here so we have clarified what does the accepted claim set represents and the claims which are um, once evidence uh, passes the integrity added to the claim set and then there are some conditional reference uh, conditional endorsements which also gets added to the accepted claim sets as i mentioned in the my earlier point of the presentation so accepted claim set has been more clarified next slide please and then uh, how the appraisal happens using accepted claim set with conditional endorsement is still under discussion and a lot of work uh, needs to be done there how we add the accept uh, what are the conditions we add the accept uh, claims into the accepted claim sets and in addition to that how do we define a group how do you collect the conditional endorsements for appraisal is something which is a work in progress so we will add more clarification and update in the next idea next slide please so next slide I think is that finishes. Yeah. Okay. So, thanks. Anyone has any more questions? We can take it off later in the call. But I think I am over time, so I would let hand it back to you, Ned and Kathleen. Right, Hank, you're next. Hi, I'm Hank. I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, sorry for the agenda um, mix. This is an update on UCCS, the unprotected CWT claim set ID. Um, 
Next slide, please. Okay, we uh, uh, conducted a working group last call, and there was uh, you know, actually a lot of um, discussion, uh, especially on the application to JSON web tokens. And uh, the, uh, there was um, a lot of proposals. I mean, Lawrence's, I think, was the most prominent one that we had could uh, um, unify the whole document to be uh, uh, UCS, also, I think, unprotected claims sets. And, and then, therefore, it would be UJCS and UCCS. Um, and I think we uh, reached a compromise there. Unfortunately, Lawrence, we weren't joining the compromise session yesterday. <laughs> so I, I, hope, I hope we will ta have taken that into account uh, as best as we could. So um, uh, there is a, uh, um, uh, in the body of the text, of the normative text, there is a notion that says uh, similar consideration apply to JSON web tokens, reference and Jose. Um, and then we uh, plan to add next to a uh, simpler, and that is addressing Jeremy's concern with the um, generics between Sibo and Jason. He was uh, worried about complexity with code generation there. Um, we'll have a sim simple UCCS appendix and a simple example how to do this with JSON web tokens. And they will be next to each other in the appendices. And, um, and I think Karsten already uh, created the pull request on the EAT side, and you wanted to create a pull request on the UCCS side correspondingly. But Karsten can help with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cross pollination. So they'll be in sync, right? So that helps to, to have these documents move as a whole. Uh, maybe as a background information, we hope to move uh, EAT, UCCS, and um, EAT media types. Uh, on block, so to speak, because they, well, you, you frown. Okay, you might be, have a different opinion, but uh, some people would like to do that. And yeah, and Thomas obviously wanted to say that. Okay, <laughs> at least Thomas would like to do that also. Um, yeah, and that is basically it. Uh, I think everything else has been discussed on this. We addressed the, this is like yet another update here. Um, we are, we are, this is the last remaining item. If you agree on this, we can uh, move on. And can basically go to Bella and Lawrence. Yeah, yeah, sure. Take your time. Lawrence is getting on the queue. That's okay. I'm recognizing you on the queue. Yeah. She has recognized Lawrence. Oh. Formally, the chairs recognize Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> am, am, I, am I that hard? Am I, am, am I that hard to recognize? Who, who, who are you again? <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm Lawrence Lundlight. Um, so the, the thing I wanted to, to discuss briefly was the progress through uh, last calls and all of that, right? Um, and I, you know, EAT is, uh, you know, been through IESG review and uh, is sitting with the, the AD right now, soon to hit the RFC editor, by my understanding of this. And I would not want it to be delayed for UCCS. That, that's, I think, a pretty important thing. Do you have a normative reference to UCCS? No. It was, Excellent. Then you'd well not That's be why we, we were very careful to, yeah. to, to not do that binding. And that's, uh, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, sort of working around to try to make sure we did not have an, uh, that normative binding. And so there okay. wouldn't be anything there. So, and you know, same with media types, you know, like media types was, was proposed to be part of EAT, but then we pulled it out because you know, mostly because Geary was concerned it, and we wanted to get E done. So that's, okay. we don't yeah. want, I want to be really clear that we want E to progress regardless of UCCS and uh, e media types, not just, just because the uh, timing is all. So I, I, I will not vote for anything to become clustered. I don't know actually okay. how that works sometimes. Okay. Just wanted to be, be clear about that in this room. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Acknowledged. At least as the uh, authors of media type and um, UCCS. Yeah, so that's it, basically. So so I think we, we, we agreed, and we have to just implement it. We will inform the list when this is done, and then uh, can uh, yeah ask the chairs what to do next. I'm a co-author. Don't look at me. To, to share, to, to <laughs> yeah, so uh, due to the sort of recent flurry of changes, it makes sense to uh, you know re-enter working group last call. 
Um, in theory, we only changed uh, um, the appendix, which is non-normative, but uh, I wouldn't mind. So I think uh, uh, Kathleen yesterday already highlighted that we could do a, a shorter last call. Uh, maybe she's chatting that right now on the chat and, and I am, I'm preempting her, but, but that was her opinion yesterday. Taking, oh. this is really rare, Kathleen said on. <laughs> I, I meant like a two week, because the last time we went through it was like a three or four <laughs> week. Yeah. yeah. So I didn't two mean like a, right. completely abridged. Yeah. 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 Karsten can help you. So Karsten once said he will uh, help expedite this. And I see Thomas moving to the mic. Yeah, I ask for the chair, could we bundle this extension with the start of the Eat Media Types working group plus core so that we can progress the three musketeers in one go? We have another agenda topic. Well, it's not on, it's it's not not on the agenda. agenda. Media types. It, it media types is not. That's why I'm yeah. getting to the mic. But media types is not on the agenda, so we could do yeah. it. We can cover it with an open mic time. Yeah. yeah. It was in San Francisco's okay. agenda, though. Just saying. We already asked for. We already asked for working group plus calling San yeah, Francisco four months ago. Yeah. So that's it on, on this um, what's, slide. What's the, what's the Are you going to do a media type working group last call or not? Uh, we can talk about it during open mic time more if you want. I'm about yeah. to leave the mic. Right. So next up would be endorsements, uh, Dave Taylor. I think we're like more than 10 minutes behind, but we're just eating open mic time. No, I'm, I'm just yeah. starting the clock. Yeah. You now have 19 minutes. 19? I have 10 minutes left. But I'll take 19 if you <laughs> give it to me. All right. <laughs> you got that on the note taker you got? She said 19, right? Note taker? All right. No. All right. Next. All right, let's go. Uh, we're going to talk about Rhett's endorsements. Next slide. All right. So uh, some things I just put in here just so we wouldn't have to have people come to the bike. Uh, this is uh, what happened at, la at IETF 117. Um, right before then, we'd added discussion of uh, conditionally endorsed values. We added some discussion of endorsing identity that there was a bunch of comments on. I've got a slide on that later. Uh, we clarified that the goal of this one is an informational document. Conceptually, this is an extension to the architecture document. There was some discussion there about the relationship to uh, CURIM and the attestation sets documents, both of which are uh, intended status proposed standard. And so we talked about it doesn't make sense to combine those. Uh, the chairs said the chairs agree. And so that's why it's not combined. This is conceptually um, architecture extension and informational only um, proposed standard ones going other documents. Uh, next slide. Um, so since IETF 117, uh, we added uh, Hank and Thomas, uh, this is Thomas uh, Basati, um, as co-authors and acknowledgments for Thomas Harjono, Lawrence, and Kathleen. Um, we updated capitalization. This is one of uh, Muhammad's comments at the end of the uh, presentation uh, at 117. I mentioned that Muhammad's comments came in after the internet draft deadline, and so we talked about the resolutions of them during the meeting, and so that's been done. And so. Uh, the capitalization now of everything now matches the RATS architecture document. Uh, we clarified text around claim sets, which was another one of his comments, um, which is the text was a little bit confusing there. And then uh, finally, the last editorial one was um, the draft used to use the word component, and it now uses target environment, again, for alignment with the, uh, the um, architecture document and the CARIM and so on have all been aligning on common terminology. So uh, next slide. Um, this is the same slide as I showed at 117. It's for me to just point out this claim sets here and each level here, app, OS, firmware, hardware, these are each a target environment. Okay, So it now uses the term target environment and talking about this diagram and instead of calling those components and so on. Okay, So again, no changes to this. This is the diagram that was shared at 117. So to keep moving, next slide. Okay. Um, 
during 117, we had a discussion of stuff that was not in the document then. And people point out, gosh, it was really important to have this concept in there. And so this is the new text that was added there. Um, because it's not sufficient to just say there's a bunch of endorsements with endorsers and so on that can endorse target environments. Because you don't want to accept an endorsement about a target environment that doesn't correspond with that endorser, right? So this is the text that says uh, you have to be able to distinguish which endorsers allowed to provide an endorsement about which target environment, right? You only trust, say, your OS vendor for statements about the OS, not about the hardware or about the app or something like that, right? Uh, the binding between how you match target environment and endorser might be a part of the appraisal policy, might be specified as part of the evidence, or some combination of the two. Details go in the proposed standard, whatever, you know, in the attestation sets or CoRAM or whatever, um, that's the detailed thing that you'd actually implement. And so it says it's up to the endorsement format spec to explain how the binding is done. Okay. So it just says there is a binding, and then your, your actual instantiation, your, your thing that you're going to normatively reference is the thing that's responsible for giving the details as to how this is done. Okay. But you've got to introduce the topic here in the architecture part. So that's the, that's, this is the actual text that was added there. So next slide. All right, um, just to keep people from having to go up to the mic again, this is the snippet from the actual minutes of last time. And so uh, Lawrence had commented that the identity endorsement is the wrong term and that uh, wanted to see a section on attestation key material. Uh, and we all said, yes, we're going to do that. Um, this slide is in here because that hasn't been done yet. This is the one open issue that we kind of agree on the intent or whatever, but the text isn't in there yet. Okay. And so attestation key material is very different from identity. Um, at the time we had Hank and maybe Lawrence had volunteered to contribute text. Um, Hank's comment was, well, there might be such a thing as device identity, but everything else we shouldn't use the term identity. So um, in terms of alignment with CoRAM and so on, the expectation is we'll probably have a different section name and so on. Just we need contributions of text to do this. Okay. Uh, and because I said, I am not the best person to write that text, but I am happy to accept contributions and hence the call for volunteers. So this is the one pending item that is going to look different by the time it's done. And so in my opinion, this is the one known issue that would prevent it from ever going to like working group last call or anything like that. Uh, but we also had a discussion that says, should this block a call for adoption? And this was Lawrence's issue. And Lawrence said, no, it should not block a call for adoption as long as we agree in principle that this is what we're going to do. And so we've agreed in principle that this is what we're going to do. We're just waiting for the actual text to come in from any contributor, whether it's Hank Lawrence or anybody else in, in this audience or online. Okay, uh, but in any case, this should not hold up working group adoption, which is the goal of the presentation now. So uh, there. Now I preempted you having to go up to the mic and repeat the same thing because we're actually all in agreement. So yeah, uh, go ahead, Mahmoud. So I don't. I personally don't. Osama from TU Dresden. So I don't personally see any issue in calling that an identity. But I think as long as we all agree that basically it's something, so I don't mind whatever name you use it. So the basic thing is that endorsement, the main thing is that a verifier needs a public key with which it can verify that a uh, bunch of evidence which is coming, right? All the claims are signed and it needs somehow that public key with which it can verify. It. And that's the most important part of endorsement. And I would like to see it as a major part of the draft itself. I completely agree that it should not hold any adoption. It's a major thing which was missing in the REDS architecture itself. Um, so I, I would basically call it a part of that document itself. But uh, I completely agree that it should be uh, not hold up any uh, adoption. Okay. Thank you. I can, uh, text contributions gratefully accepted. I don't plan on authoring the text for this one myself, but I'm happy to act as the editor when other people contribute text. And I think there's agreement that there's conceptually two different types of things that you may or may not use that weren't identity for. Identity of the device and then the key material of the endorser are both important concepts to walk through. So, um, okay, um, next slide. Because this is the one technical open issue, okay. So, um, this, uh, so the request is to adopt this as a working group document. We actually introduced this question last time and the chairs wanted to see more discussion about the relationship with their documents. That's now done. I mean, that's happened, reported the results. And so the request to the working group is, uh, can we adopt this now so we can change the file name? Uh, but again, still uh, welcome text contributions and co-authors. Again, the only current open issue that we know of right now is the key material one. 
And so after adopted, if we can get that settled or whatever, that it's possible we could go to working group last call in a timely fashion because it's just how do how many times we got to iterate on the key material, which is the, the big issue, right? So, um, so that's it uh, for me. And so I guess the next step is for the chairs to figure out how to do the uh, working group adoption step. Well, I mean, last time we heard a bunch of support. We can ask it again now, but I'll leave that to you guys to, to manage. We can do a, a poll to yeah. see if. Um, so poll. let me just have a raise of hands. I know we've had some feedback, but let me just do it again. Who has read the draft? If, you, if you've read Rat's endorsement. Because I'm, I'm challenged. Uh, I mean, like, you know. OK, there we go. <laughs> Who has read the draft? All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to go uh, click yes right now. I'm raising my hand just not for a question, but to raise my hand here to say I have read okay. the draft. Thank you, Yogesh. Yeah, obviously you've aligned the CoRIM document with it, so. Yes. Okay. Did you start it? Yeah. Yeah, so there's at least at least 10 because I'm counting myself that have read the document. Okay, that, that's, that's yeah, good. Yeah, but you, you're an author. You I know. Count. Well, technically so is uh, Thomas okay. and so is Hank Nows, but I don't think. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Okay, let's, let's not go there. Okay. It is not AI generated, in case you were wondering. <laughs> Hold on. Hey, guys, can we go ahead? Thomas, you said? Okay. Two yes votes? Two, two additional yes. Two, yeah. two additional. Okay. Okay, so we have sufficient. Um, can you do. Can you do um, the call of adoption here, and then we can confirm on the mail list? He thought there's no opinion. Yeah. 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 It, could, it could also be not paying attention. <laughs> it, it's for the minute saver. We'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, so I think it's stabilizing up. Ah, people are waking up. <laughs> as soon as I say this, people wake up. Okay, I'm going to count to three. Going once. T? Oh. Going twice. You need a deeper voice. Do the deep work. <laughs> All right, so we've got 22 people in favor. So let me do the confirmation of a mm -hmm. mail list mm -hmm. and then. OK. And then the next version, presumably, and unless you tell me otherwise, I'll try to post it. the next version yeah. can go from there. OK. All right. Great. Thanks. OK. Who's doing the message wrapper? Message, message wrapper. Thomas. Thomas. Can we get the slides? Next, please. Next, please. Okay, recap. What is this uh, conceptual message wrapper? It's a generic encapsulation format for RAS messages, whatever they are, evidence, attestation results, um, um, ref values, uh, whatnot, which reuses the media type system. Um, and so it's, it's based on a media type system and, uh, and, deriv and derivatives, so uh, co-op content formats. 
as well as uh, RFC 9277 um, seaboard tags and native seaboard tags. Um, it has uh, both JSON and CBER serialization for accommodating different use cases. So you can embed this stuff into, say, for example, a REST payload um, uh, in, an, in a web API, as well as, uh, for example, um, a, a TLS and shake message like we did before a tested TLS. So it's very, very um, flexible uh, encapsulation. Next, please. Um, status. Okay, so we have closed all issues uh, which had open on, on the repo, uh, including the mega detailed review that Carl Wallace uh, provided. Thank you very much. We published 04, which fixes all these issues. And I think yesterday I posted 05 to just you know, do some cosmetic things um, and finish off the thing. So on top of that, we have uh, running code for the full uh, draft. So the, the, the code implements completely the spec under Verizon CMW. And we think the document is basically ready. So next, please. Oh, Hannes is uh, in, in the queue. Yeah. I. I um... So maybe, so this has been discussed a couple of times already on the document. Um, and, but uh, a few of the people here I recognize are new. Um, so I thought that I should in one sentence summarize on why this is really important. Um, we have in RATS developed E and, and their various other evidence formats. And as you put this into a protocol to convey it to the remote party for remote attestation, you run into this problem that each different protocol handles the delivery of this information differently. And this document defines the mechanism to harmonize this. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's supposed to help protocol developers and protocol designers to make the distribution of these evidence payloads yeah. easier. Just as a summary, in case you haven't been following the last few meetings. Next, please. So we would like to ask again if the document could be adopted, also because there's a TCG dependency uh, hanging about, and um, and uh, go directly for a working groupless core because uh, we really deem the thing is um, is in excellent shape. Next. Oh. <laughs> Because I have a rat phobia. Yeah. It's a mouse. 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 We have to follow process. Who's read it? Who's handled it? The same motion. All right. <clears throat> We're putting the question who's read the draft? How many authors do we? Okay, how many fifty authors actually responded to this? It's like I think the. Yeah, I mean to subtract the authors is what I'm doing. What's that? Oh. Why don't the authors just pick themselves out of the book? Yeah. Okay. I haven't voted with you. Okay. Can the authors please unvote? Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, even the question <laughs> talks four. Okay, so I am going to count to three. So those who want to vote need to vote now. Going once, going twice. Okay, if I discount the authors, there's still six. So, okay, so let's do the next question. Yeah, he rings me. I mean, even if I did the full four, honey. All right. There's still sufficient. You good? You got the vote count? Yeah. Did you get the vote count, honey? Okay. Okay. So who um, who believes that this is ready to be adopted? Is Opus to the system or? It doesn't matter. Hank's in the queue. Sorry? You're in the queue? Yeah. Do you have a very fine question about the book? No. I saw a YouTube video. Um, <laughs> about, <laughs> that's a great start, right? <laughs> no, basically about the new meat echo and the the the, the voice uh, explaining things to me said that the uh, hands raised tool is as anonymous and it's absolutely okay for any author involved party to raise hands because it's an anonymous call and you're not called out. Um, um, but it's very different to working group last call on a list. So this is the hum tool with the show hands and and I think there is no. Uh, no reason for anyone to uh, hesitate to uh, raise a hand or have an opinion in this uh, hands tool. That's my interpretation of a YouTube video. So a co author can <laughs> Okay, so the numbers are actually not as high as the previous one. I think what I want to do is follow procedure here. So I'm going to confirm the adoption call first on the mail list. Once we have that, then I can do the, is this draft ready for working group last call? I don't but want to do it. I don't have that on my action items. I was just looking at my notes. So if I'm, if I was supposed to, sorry. Don't worry. But I'm writing it here. Um, <clears throat> okay. Okay, I think we're ready for the next one. Epic markers. Epic markers. Oh. Yeah, that is a fun one. So depending on your pronunciation, this is about epoch or epic markers. What's your name, My name is Hank. What's up? Oh, yeah. So I'm a epoch bell ringer. <laughs> <laughs> it says so on my badge. Thank you, Dave, for reminding me. <laughs> Ringing in a new age of freshness once in a while. Um, okay, next slide. So this is actually correct. Uh, so since San Francisco, um, we address the rest of Carl's uh, Carl Wallace's review. Again, also with this ID, a uh, ton of very useful input. Uh, the thing that was holding up most was the multi multi nonce, which is of course not a thing. Um, it was a mental uh, help to understand what this does. Um, 
quick reminder, an evidence bell uh, distributes the epoch marker in a, in a domain. And, uh, for, and the payload can be used like a nonce. So if you receive it, there will be a nonce-like structure in there. And then you can embed that in your evidence, for example, generate it, send it to the verifier that also has received the exact same epoch marker, knows that, and now can tell that is this in this age of freshness. Um, um, but that's not a nonce, because first of all, in British, that's a very bad thing, I heard. And, uh, and also, it is not used only once. Um, so we scratched our heads and came up with an epoch tick because clocks tick. And uh, the first thing I heard was that ticks are animals that dig into your skin and then latch there. But when you look at Urban Dictionary, it's a way up step from nonce. If you don't know what a nonce is, look it up. Um, so tick is way better, <laughs> whatever we do here. <laughs> it's an epoch tick. If you have a better name, yeah, yeah, exactly. Come to us. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm, I'm going with that. One. So um, uh, last time the reference to concise evidence was not uh, public yet. That is now included as one of the uh, options of veracity proofs of the epoch bell because it's important for the bell to be trustworthy. So optionally, the bell, uh, sorry, the epoch marker can include uh, uh, attestation results or even evidence if it's small enough about its uh, trustworthiness. Um, the most important part here, uh, payload, I think payload number one is uh, the SIBA time tag because the epoch marker will be a uh, modern substitute for a timestamp time stamp token uh, issued by a timestamp authority, which is RFC 3161. And that is pretty uh, dated, and uh, we want to give it, give it more flexibility. But one of the applications of the epoch marker is to be the payload returned in a uh, TSA-esque TSA protocol. But this come, doesn't come with a protocol. You can build one around that. Um, we were told by Carl that maybe the handling of nonces in certain scenarios uh, should be elaborated on. Um, we thought about that, and that's probably not the task of the epoch marker ID. It's a task of the reference interaction model, where uh, the handles, which could be epoch IDs or uh, other handles like nonces, um, for recentness and freshness proofs, uh, are elaborated on. And I think there's, again, you know, we have an issue now to, to address it there. Um, that's basically uh, uh, what, what has been accomplished. We have now. Uh, three open issues, basically more, more questions. Um, again, I was highlighting that we would like to include a veracity proof uh, about the trustworthiness of the epoch bell that uh, will issue these epoch markers over time. And um, um, I've seen work where other working groups that I also author in decided that the evidence they want to convey is any or a bundle of any and a certification path. That's pretty open. We are not entirely sure how restrictive we should be here. We could do the exact same thing. We could allow for a CMW and be done. Um, I think that's a working group decision. Um, I'm rather agnostic on the outcome, to be honest, as long as it is possible for the epoch bell to prove its trustworthiness with each uh, tick. Then um, we have uh, a uh, no new uh, type. Uh, have, and then, then sometimes when you use a, a epoch marker like um, the TSA TST, um, maybe as a small recap, that was used when you wanted to sign a document, don't have a trustworthy clock, uh, go to a clock, get the timestamp, and then sign your PDF, for example. That's very important. That is known that it's not older than this uh, point of time. So, um, or younger. And then um, the, the thing is, um, to do that, sometimes you create things called imprints, like, like the, a hash of the PDF, send that as extra data to the uh, uh, epoch bell in this case, and then if that, that would be embedded in, um, 
the, uh, the signature. Um, there are other ways to do this. Uh, it always depends when in which process you can do that. Sometimes the thing is already signed and you want still to attach something uh, uh, like in an unprotected header, then the procedure is a little bit different. So we just laid out these procedures in a different ID in COSI, which is uh, how to embed the old school TSA, TST uh, token in a, a COSI uh, header, as a COSI header parameter. And that now, just since two days, describes the modes of use, how to create the timestamp. And I think exactly these modes would also apply to the uh, CBO time tag in the epoch marker. So uh, the question is now, uh, do we have to uh, clone that? Or do we um, just reference that? I don't know, working group call. Uh, sorry, working group decision. Um, and then, yeah, there are some extension points. Are this good enough? And then I would like again to ask for call for adoption. I don't have a cute red though. Okay, so do you, Hannes? Oh, actually, Dave is on the queue first. Um, so from the 117 minutes, uh, the main discussion at 117 was about whether it was more appropriate. I mean, by the way, this is a great draft, and uh, I, I do support this work. Um, but the discussion last time was about whether it should be in the COSI working group or the RATS working group. And you can read through the uh, minutes there, but the last two... At the end of that, I said they should go to COSE flag for rats expert review. And then Kathleen, as the chair, said get expert opinions you need from this group on the 10% that pertains to rats, then send it over to COSE. I noticed you didn't address that, but before you do actually do a call for adoption, uh, I wanted to remind us that that was the outcome of 117. Um, and so I'd like to hear why it should be in this working group rather than COSE, because I do support it. I would absolutely support it in COSE. So the, the only thing that we discussed with participants in COSI is how familiar with, with the, how, how familiar with the difference between freshness and recentness. And I, I think the, that is that motivated me to come here for a call for adoption. Yeah, the, the minutes from last time said 10% of it, of the content of the document yeah. is about freshness and the expertise is here. 90% of it has nothing to do with freshness and is more appropriate for COSI. Yeah. And so that was a discussion about, okay, which group should it be in and the outcome of that, the suggestion, right? So maybe there's a new learning or whatever, was it should be in COSI for the 90% with cross reviews to make sure that the 10% is right in this group. So that was the outcome of that one. If there's not any new information, I'm just telling you how I'm going to vote when the vote comes up. Yeah, I'm just reiterating that the rest, the 90% of the model is, is payload def definitions. Okay, Hank, I think the question is, did you approach the COSI group and present there? I did not approach the COSI group. I had a conflict. I couldn't. Which is what Dave was asking. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, Hannes, I, um, I was wondering what I, one part or a significant part of the work is actually defining the protocol to distribute the epochs, in my opinion. Um, where is that work going to be done? Wherever you want. There's no protocol to this. There, there is. You need to distribute the ebox. Yeah, but there's no protocol defined in this document. Yeah, but but to, in order to have a system it's that actually works, you need to define a protocol. Where do you want to do the protocol? I don't know. Okay. The idea is that other people will make use of this, and and the the I don't want to steal time, but um um. There are multiple ways to do this, and, and making a single protocol for this makes no sense. Okay, I'm going to close the queue. Um, Thomas? Thomas. So to, to, to answer um, Hannes' question, Hannes, there's an interaction model draft where this thing can go at an abstract level. We don't have, for challenge response, for example, we don't have protocols defined in RATS, but we have an interaction model which is describes the high level what, what, what the kind of interaction should, should be. And this would be the same for... My, yeah, I understand that it's easy and so on, but it's like with, with the just mentioned nonce, uh, we have been working on documents that define how the nonce works, uh, but I'm, I'm looking forward on how the nonce is transported in protocols, but I, I, I've, it would be good um, for a complete solution to also have at least one uh, 
specification somewhere on how to use this. Okay. Um, well, could you name me one protocol that transports and eat? Cheap. Wonderful. Cheap. Could have, yeah, alongside the nonce, any book. Well, I mean, it, but yeah, it, so that's what you're suggesting? One example. Again, there can be a variety of protocols depending how you use it. That's the point. Well, I mean, epochs are used in other ways. So, um, what I'm hearing, Hank, is there's still some issues based on what Hannes just raised and what Dave raised. So we can help you as the chairs facilitate the conversation with Posey as well. Yeah, that Before. would be excellent. Again, I was only speaking with participants, not with the chairs, because I, I could have hunted them down. Um, but okay. I did not yet. So <laughs> find them on the side. <laughs> Okay, we have we we do have time, but we need to keep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so okay, please help facilitate so that. That would be awesome. We can reach out to the cozy chairs yeah. and either have expert review, but it would be better to have that group of participants also chime in whether mm -hmm. they would take it on in cozy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Again, yeah. We'll help you do that. And I think that's it. Thank so you. Just... Okay, next is attestation sets. Kathleen? Yep, are you you're pulling up the deck, right? Yep. It looks like Ned's still working on it. He's, he's getting to it. All right, great. So this is just an updated deck from a previous IETF uh, March 2021 when I first presented this. So if, and if you just go to the next slide. So with this work, I consulted with several people who were very active in the trusted computing group who had done basically what Dave's draft describes for firmware, right? So they had done the claim sets and actually implemented against the reference integrity measurement document to attest firmware, which provides an assurance of um, NIST 800-193. And the document was shaped very specifically from working with those individuals who had already done that, that type of work. Um, actually, next slide, please. Um, so you could see the diagram on the right, and this is the same one I used from IETF 112, looks very similar to what Dave, oh, actually, no, my next slide looks more similar. Um, and this gets to the point of, you know, you can, you can, so, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sick right now, so I have COVID. Um, let's see. The All right, let me just try to start over. Um, it's very early in the morning, plus I'm dealing with being sick, so I apologize. Um, let's see. So since local attestations were being used to prove out something like the firmware is as expected, um, or the BIOS is as expected. The idea was this was already covered and it used local attestations. And so the discussions I had was, okay, you don't need to standardize any of that. So what we really would need is just how do you convey to another party that those local attestations either all checked out or they didn't all check out, right? So what does that full claim set look like? What worked and what didn't work? Um, and that remediation could occur. And that, that all happens right now. Um, you know, the, the firmware was the first to do it, but um, actually the first to do it in deployed implementations, but there was a full stack um, assessment done 
at least a decade ago by Cisco, um, RSA, Cisco, RSA, uh, VMware, and I think one other vendor. And, um, and, and they pulled, you know, they, they proved out that they could attest all of the software fully up the stack and they had it nested in the way that Dave's draft suggests. Um, and so with a former AD hat on, I thought, well, what's useful for, for actual standardization? And that's the next slide. <coughs> so this looks more similar to Dave's, but um, a more complex version. And this is the same slide I shared back at IETF 112. So you would do the claim set for firmware, like, um, like is currently done with the reference integrity measurements. But if you wanna package that up and send it to share remotely to um, a system that keeps track of the posture of an entire environment, you're just gonna to wanna to package up an, a, a single statement. You're not going to wanna to package up all of the logs that prove it out because that's just too much bandwidth. You can't do that for thousands of systems on a network and all of the individual software on a system, all of the operating systems, all of the firmware. So a single attestation to say, the local system assures that this claim set was met is the goal of this particular draft, right? So just standardizing what does that exchange look like so that people could register to say, I'm using the DISA STIG and it's fully attested or you know, certain claims weren't met and it could include pointers back to where you would find the log, like the PCR log that uh, contains the evidence um, and any other information. And so that's what would be conveyed on the wire is, you know, is it a CIS benchmark? Is it a DISA STIG? Um, what at the firmware operating system or application level that is grouped is, is either meeting what the claim set wants or says, or how, how it's being met by the claim set. And so that's the idea is just to get those standardized so that they can communicate to any posture management type systems. Um, currently, if you look at like, um, well, in a tradition, so this maps really easily with a traditional environment. If you look to a cloud native environment, there's all different product sets popping up. Um, and within those, people are using SSH and other mechanisms to assure posture. What could happen instead is that from the container orchestration system, you could bake in the attestation of the operating system of the application and just be able to send a claim set to that management. Um, CSPM is one of the acronyms or CNAP tools rather than having it come in and interrogate. So it's a, a simpler way that ideally would cost less money um, for those with fewer resources too, which is part of um, my current objective set is, you know, how do we make security a little bit less expensive and more built in, um, in a way that makes sense. And I know a few people have read the draft, so I'm wondering if there's any questions at this point. And, and I hope my being sick wasn't uh, too, <laughs> too difficult. So we have uh, Thomas on the queue. Yes. Thomas, <clears throat> hi Kathleen, thank you very much for the draft. I read it last night and I jotted down a couple of notes here. The first one is that in, uh, in the Confidential Computing Consortium, we have a uh, GRC SIG, a Governance Risk Compliance SIG, that deals with the use of attestation for risk compliance. And I think this high level you know, kind of aggregation work is very relevant there. So we'll put you in contact with Mark Novat, who, who chairs the, the SIG to compare notes with him. And maybe well, what I think is he, he would be a great co-author for, for, for you if, if you wanted to and if you want to. Yes, that would be um, great. I would really appreciate the connection. Cool, cool. I will do that. Um, the second thing that I would, it was a bit confusing for me while, while reading is that um, 
I don't understand very well the the distribution of roles in your architecture, and therefore I don't I don't know whether this work is in scope or out of scope of <laughs> maths. Uh, in particular, so what I think I understand is you have a composite device that generates some complex multi-layered evidence, and then you have this local verifier is bundled together with the this complex device, which does the uh, appraisal, right? And produces some attestation results. Then these attestation results are passed on to uh, uh, a airline part, an application that um, sort of consumes these attestation results, applies the appraisal policy for attestation results and creates this attestation, quote unquote, which is what NIST uh, has in the second definition, right? Um, so the, the thing that they say, uh, the, the statement based on a decision that fulfillment of specified requirements have been demonstrated, blah, blah, blah. Um, if that is the case, then where, do you, where would you stick these uh, claims that you want to standardize? In an attestation results or in something that is produced by the relying party? Because in the first case, and this is perfectly in scope with rats, in the second case, I think it's at the, at the border with the architecture. So I'm not sure, do you understand my concern? I don't know if I made I it do, clear. I um, do, but if you could put it on the list, uh, I'll respond there. I'm, I'm not at my best. Absolutely. I will copy these notes on the list. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna have to close the queue at Hank. Sorry, AJ. <laughs> Hi, this is Kay. Hi, this is Hank. Hi, Kathleen. Sorry that you're not feeling so well. Um, I'm making this quick. So um, as a TCG chair head on, what exactly do you mean with local attestation? Is that implicit attestation or, or what is, where is this, where, where, from which document is that term derived? Local versus remote? Yeah, exactly. Local attestation, I don't think, is a term that is used in TCG. So that is, I'm, I'm wondering uh, what, what okay, the reference is. Okay, so a lot is. of discussion forums. If uh, So I'm not in the TCG, as you know. Um, yeah. And when I consulted with people in the TCG, that was over three years ago. Um, this work is not new, right? Um the concept I think is definitely still needed because how would you convey this information? Uh, I think it's just getting down to semantics and this group has created lots of language uh, to describe things. And so mine might not match perfectly with where the group has gone in the last few years in terms of defining lots of new terms. Okay, you have a just- but local like on the system itself, as opposed to interrogating from, from the outside. So. <clears throat> okay. I have a suspicion, but you mean there, we can make this on the list and, and not now, not, probably not the right time. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And the other people who had questions or comments, I'd love to hear them. So if you could put it to the list, that would be great. So do you have a next steps, Kathleen? Or well, I'd like to know to... how many people have read the draft. I've read the draft and would be interested in seeing this this work done. Um, you know, I, I don't know how else we would get to a registry. I'm happy to shape it up however it's needed, but I don't know how else we would get to a registry without getting this into the working group so that you can communicate that kind of information to this plethora of tool sets that are emerging, the, the CNAP tool sets, the CSPM. So I, I think there's a, a, a big need for this. All and right, I would so just hate to see it like not, not move again for another year or so because um, okay. the industry is just gonna keep moving and the product sets that do posture assessment are just gonna become more complex. Okay. So somehow we've eaten into the 40 minutes that we had open. So I'm gonna move this along really quick. We're gonna do a poll. Um, so please respond quickly. Who has read this draft? Yeah, the virtual hands.
Okay, I'm gonna close it going once, going twice. Okay, so Kathleen, you can see the poll. 10 people have read the draft. Do you want me to ask the question of, um, <coughs> is this something that the working group can take on? Is that that would be want? great. Okay. I guess it's 12 people for the record now. Yeah, how did you get 12, Kathleen? Oh, maybe I'm not seeing, under latest results, I'm seeing 12. That's a different poll. Yeah, you're, Scroll to the bottom. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, go ahead yeah, and start. That's fine. We just need the yes, no. Okay, please respond whether this working group can take on the attestation draft. All right, and for the no's, I'd be curious if it's just because of the current state and um, as opposed to the work, because <clears throat> I think it's really needed. Okay, please vote. I'm gonna close it. Going once, going twice, two and a half. Closed. What, what was the last number? Eight, so Kathleen, the numbers are eight, five, and a bunch of no opinions. So I suspect if you, if you map it to the taxonomy and clarify, you might get a yep. different outcome. We're right. Okay. And then hopefully work with Mark as well from the Confidential Computing Consortium. Yep. Sounds good. All right. I've got to keep things moving because we're Thank you. Yep. So I'm going to keep the last two presentations to, to their time. So X509 evidence. Thank is very tall. Okay, thank you. I hope I can do this fast. How much time do I have? And let's see if I can give you some back. 15 minutes. 15. You have 14 minutes and Yeah, I can do it faster than that. Okay, cool. This is a draft that Hannes and I put forward. Uh, currently, it's just Hannes and I. I think we have space for extra authors and I think we'd like some, right? Yeah. Um, so this is spillover work from LAMPS. So LAMPS, we started doing how to put an attestation into a CSR and this is but now we're trying to find what actually that data is going to be. Next, please. So the background here, this is a product of the, we're calling ourselves the PKIX attestation design team. We've been meeting bi-weekly since April. Uh, it's mainly a collection of HSM vendors, uh, Udamako, Talas, and Cypher, uh, a few others, and a couple of public CAs. And we're trying to figure out how an HSM can tell a CA that this key is stored in hardware and here are some properties of it. And you can imagine all sorts of ways where a CA might care where the private key is stored in order to decide if it complies with a given certificate profile or not. Um, so we, this design team has already produced the I, draft IETF LAMPS CSR attestation, which is moving along nicely. And that just says, if you have an attestation, here's how you carry it through a CSR, but makes no assumptions about what that attestation is. Now we also need an attestation format. And so under the CAB forum, the code signing baseline requirements that went into force last summer, certificate subscribers looking for code signing certs need to prove to their CA that keys are stored in a FIPS or common criteria certified module, non-exportable and sort of all the things you expect. There is currently no automated way to do that. So I can speak as a CA, it's a pain in the butt. We get like people taking cell phone photos of HSMs and being like, look, here's an HSM. And I'm like, cool, you own an HSM. What does it have to do with this CSR? Or like the, the one that we really hate is uh, our build infrastructure is in Amazon. Uh, we use KMS. I don't know where the keys come from. And we're like, I, 
is that FIPS? I didn't hear. So that's what we're trying to solve here. Um, we are aware that there exist a lot of attestation formats out there already. Why do we need another one? Uh, none of the ones that exist meet our needs. Specifically, none of them are sort of FIPS or common criteria specific. So we think, you know, this work is being done. We need to take this work somewhere. I almost could have taken this to sec dispatch because there's a dispatch question here. Is rats the right place for this work? That's question number one. Um, so let me define, let me go on to the next slide and say what we're actually doing. So here's the technical content. We have taken eat. We have said we like the eat claims. We don't like the eat encoding. We want them to be X509. And for the moment, we're proposing to do that as X509 V3 extensions. So the, the, the evidence format statement actually is an X509 certificate. We're not married to that idea that if we want to define a specific ASN1 structure to carry it, that would be acceptable to the group, but we stuck it in X509 because that was sort of easy to put together. Uh, I see, Hank, I will take your question at the end. Um, then on top of EAT, so it's the EAT claim semantics, but uh, ASN1 encoding of them. And then we've added a few HSM specific things. So FIPS conformance, common criteria conformance um, are the two that are in there now. I think we need to add a few more like non-exportable, backupable, card control, dual control. I think we can get all the HSM vendors to probably with enough twisting of arms sort of agree on definitions for these things that are vendor neutral. Although that seems to take many, many hours to get Dallas and Udamaku to agree on a definition of anything. But this is, this is sort of what we're trying to do. EAT plus FIPS specific claims. Um, my next slide I think is just an adoption question. Yeah, version 00, zero but it shows a direction. Um, we do need to sync with TCG and DICE. I think there are some semantics that need to be harmonized across these documents and we've got that all sort of lined up. We just haven't done it yet. So the question is, is this, is, is RATS the right home for this work? Uh, should we adopt it? Are there anyone else interested in joining this design team or joining as an author? Um, and I do have one more slide which shows open issues that we are currently aware of, but I think I'm happy to admit there are open issues. This is a work in progress. Let's go back to the adoption slide. I'm not going to present this. Ta-da! Hi, this is Hank. Uh, this is one of the problems using the term attestation because I assume that actually the FIPS and the CC, the common criteria stuff, is not attestation. So not, not, not evidence. It's endorsement. So, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it might be okay still to bundle that. Evidence. But... Here I'm talking about evidence. Yeah, but then you can't talk about FIPS and CCC conformance. I can. I, I am an HSM. Yes. I can, I, can, I, I can assert, I can provide evidence that I booted in FIPS mode. That's an endorsement. I, I can, no. I can provide evidence that I ran the self-tests. I can provide evidence that my DRBG is in FIPS mode. I can provide ah, evidence okay. that, that I've turned off the non-FIPS algorithms. Yes. I, as far as I am concerned, am in FIPS mode. Whether that, that is, matches a published certificate, don't know, don't this care. It's fine. That's a self-assertion self because you sign things as a root of trust that you blindly trust, and it can blindly tell you anything at once. Without an endorsement, that won't work. But then you can yeah. say that is the evidence part, but you, it, is, it is worthless without the endorsement part. I that agree there's also an endorsement part. Okay, but whether then, that's then a human the goes page. to the NIST CMVP Wonderful. website and looks up a page, I, yeah. that is out of scope for this document. Yeah, okay, okay. But I just want to make clear um, that, okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I would like to contribute, actually. Monty? Hi, um, Monty Wiseman, Beyond Identity, also TCG Infrastructure Working Group co-chair. Um, I'm very excited about this work. I will, um, I will uh, very much contribute to this effort. Very much okay. needed. Great. My email address should be findable. Please uh, shoot me one, and I'll add you to the design meetings and such. Thank you. Mohammed. Osama. So uh, I'm trying to understand the context. The way you presented it, it was very focused on TCG dice and HSM. And in the draft, I'm seeing you are writing the first sentence of introduction, trusted execution environments like secure elements and hardware security modules. Trusted execution environments are something else. They have nothing to do with the secure elements and HSMs. Hannes? And I find three uh, I, I specific instances let's, of let's let trusted execution that. environments in the draft. And my question specifically would be, uh, are you interested somehow, is this draft going to somehow take into account trusted execution environments? I will be happy to contribute, but if it's not, then please clarify in the draft. 
Uh, quick response to Osama. Um, so the DE terminology is taken from deep, which is uh, broader. And maybe I missed the reference, uh, which I should obviously add. And that would include also not would also include HSMs and other contexts. So the as Mike said, the initial sort of customer, so to speak, as of this work of this design team, are the HSMs in sort of like the classically big X context. But uh, it's not far fetched to see how this work can also be applied to other trusted execution environment in right. this deep terminology. But we. Yeah, so one, what, one case that we want to include, if you have a FIPS certified TPM, then you can use Windows Cert Store, Cappy, for doing code signing if you can prove that your TPM is FIPS certified. So we want to include that, but we don't want to include all of TPMs, really just sort of FIPS compliance. Yeah, stuff. that's fine. But, but I, I would completely disagree with the deep definition of having TPMs as a TEE, that's that's a completely different thing. But uh, yeah, no, we can fix will, language. We will see. I think, uh, yeah, the, the, the OO was put in pretty hastily. We can fix language. Yeah, Dave Taylor. Um, so TPMs are not a TEE in that sense, but secure elements are. Um, so anyway, um, I was going to say that uh, about six or seven years ago, we did something like this in some demos that we did at public demos that we did at Microsoft, uh, which way predates the eat spec. And so I did briefly read through, I haven't read every line, but I did read a bunch of the spec and I think it's great. Um, I support it. No, I don't have time to help uh, co-author it or whatever, but I do support this to says this is the sort of thing that we would have implemented if it had been around at the time. So I think it is good for the rest working group to do. And our use case was specifically doing this in a TE. It wasn't for your use case. But I skimmed through it and I said, this is useful for a TE use case, just to answer Muhammad's question. So uh, I support this work. Thanks. Right. So I was going to have a debate about how broadly we want the intro sentence. It, yeah. I'd say as long, it, I didn't see anything that was really constrained to HSMs. I think it is applicable to TEs, and that's the case we were using it in. And we were doing something very similar. We just had different different claims and stuff because it was just arbitrary, right? Because there wasn't like eat things to map to. I think the notion that you said that you're trying to map exactly eat claims is a really good thing. Let's try to keep that alignment. Okay, Brendan's the last on the queue, by the way. I uh, Lawrence Lundlade. Um, I'm, uh, you were defining two new claims uh, relative to FIPS and another certification. I, I don't remember. <laughs> Common criteria. Uh, CC, yeah. Um, uh, have you looked at the DLOA's claim in EAT, which is intended for something of this nature? Yeah, so that gets to Hank's comment about our endorsements versus yeah, assertions yeah. and what we're trying to do is assert that i booted with all the so like you might look up my dloa and see that it only applies if i'm in configuration 17 and i need to okay. state that i booted in configuration okay. 17. okay okay so you're basically it's this is more of a booted state sort of thing yeah sure no no no, no question i just wanted to check in on the dlas um then when you define these two these two other claims how will you define them and where will you define them and what formats will you define them for? Because basically what we're moving into now is with this uh, is um, defining claims now in a third format. Um, and now do we expand the, the uh, CWT registry to support, you know, conceptually so, somehow, you know, because we're, we're using it for, for, was there another registry there? How do we track them all? Yeah, so and I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the answer you don't like, which is I don't care. Uh, this, does, <laughs> this, group Play, of HSM vendors, this, HSM, this group of HSM vendors started with the assertion that we want ASN1. Yeah, okay. We do not want CBOR. We do not want CMW. Okay. We, are, we are an HSM wow. shop. We're all HSM shops. Yeah, we all agreed okay. on that. And we're okay. doing this in ASN1. And okay. if other people want to take the semantics somewhere else, that's your. So, I mean, are you go, are you, you're just going to define them in an RFC? Basically, okay, all right. I still think that's claim jumping, but. Brendan's on the queue. Hi, I think you actually just answered my question. I was going to ask why you didn't like Seabor and why you liked ASN1 better. And that doesn't really sound to me like a uh, technical argument. So um, when I brought the suit manifest to the IETF some five years ago, uh, I was told that there should be no new ASN1. Uh, we had arguments for it at the time. They weren't good enough then. Why are they good enough now? I, at the risk of 
trashing the agenda here. I'll just say that like it's a time to market argument. It's the HSM. This has to be done inside FIPS and common criteria sort of certified code boundaries, and we don't want to add new format and parsers and emitters. It's really that simple. Okay, so uh, you've got people interested. Um, we can do a quick show of who's actually, do you mind? Who's actually read the draft? So we're gonna start a poll. Okay, in the interest of time, going once, going twice, and you can cut the queue. So we actually, you actually have, I should have asked who's not an author, but you actually have a few people. So I guess I have not had a chance to read this, so I'm still struggling. Is it purely rats or is it a combination of rats and lamps? We think the how to carry it in a CSR is lamps. We think what is it is rats. Okay, so let's um, I actually want to get more. I want to see more direct feedback before I do the call for adoption. So for the, okay, so ask it the way we ask the attestation sets. Um, do you believe this working group would be interested in working on this draft? Well, the intent is, should this working, is there interest? The question is, <laughs> do the participants believe this working group should be working on this draft? So I'm putting a lot of pressure on them, sorry. <laughs> we have the experts here, not as well. Okay, so I think it's pretty unanimous. So going once, twice, we will cut the queue because the number is pretty, pretty overwhelming. So there's over 20 people. Um, what I'd like to see is some more feedback on the draft itself before I'm happy to do the call for adoption. Um, so for those that have read the draft, can we just take it to the mail list in the interest of time, provide feedback? on its readiness, and then you guys can ask me over mail, ask the chairs, if you want to do the call for adoption before the next <coughs> We have to ask on the list anyway. Yeah. Perfect. Good, good, good outcome. Thank you. Does someone want to join the design team? What? Yeah, if more people want to join the design team, email Hannah Sarai, please. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. It only went two minutes over. All right. No, 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 some of it is just us trying to run the logistics. Okay, so I did not approve your last slides because when you, you can't submit slides while we're running the session. It's fine, so I missed a few people who have to use it. Okay, so. Sorry? 
so I asked for the request for sharing. Oh, you did? Yeah, but it, it, it's only the preloaded slides. So this is the problem. It takes a while. So it says you're sharing, right? No, I I clicked the approved, but it's the preloaded slides. You can't share it from your. Think we, tried we, we tried it before the meeting. It did. Oh, it's not. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So we'll approve it after it's so fine. that they get the latest. Sure, sure, sure. But just so you know in the future. Yeah, okay. Okay, you have 14 minutes, sorry. Yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'm Osama from Team Dresden, and this is work we have done in the CPEC project uh, funded by the DFG. And uh, we thought it's interesting for the RADS group because it's working on remote attestation and which is one of the most important characteristics of confidential computing. So that's why we are here to share some of the learnings that we had going through the process of formal verification, how it relates to RADS architecture. And uh, this is the basic agenda that I want to motivate what this topic is about and um, the specific approach that we have taken and then about the results, a uh, quick summary of the results and finally summarize. Um, so this audience at least knows, uh, everybody knows about this RADS architecture, what it is, the verifier, attester and relying party, all that. So I will skip this, but the question to ask is basically, is RAD sufficient for confidential computing use cases? So is there something, is, is this level of abstraction, so to say, is sufficient to talk about attestation inside confidential computing use cases? And that's, that's, that, that, was, that was our initial starting point where we had a look at RADs because in the, inside the confidential, confidential computing consortium, this is used as a standard uh, terminology. And here on this slide, you see that basically uh, there was SCX um, a breach, which could actually get the attestation keys and use that in order to issue fake codes. So whatever you put it on tweet, it will issue you a legal uh, code that will be verified by the verifier. So that that's, seems to indicate that this, there is something missing inside um, the, the architecture level details need to be incorporated and not only the high level picture of how does this communicate with the verifier. And more recently, uh, the solution which is called as TDX, which is at the VM based level of abstraction, the whole VM uh, is encrypted. Um, and this is one uh, recent uh, news, which is that Google Cloud uh, let Intel uh, so Google Cloud was allowed to access the Intel's resources, and then they could found they could find the ten uh, major bugs inside that. So the approach that we have taken with this motivation, like how how do we reason about this at the confidential computing level of uh, of the things? They are very complicated mechanisms, and we need to reason about that. That's why we raise the level of abstraction to somewhere where where we can actually try to understand these mechanisms. At, uh, at some um, level of abstraction. So this is the overall um, architecture um, that we have compressed the part. And uh, uh, this is also one open question. Why should, we, why should we actually have the verifier and the relying party as in the RATS architecture? And why not just have the um, architecturally defined attestation as we call it? Which is that we have the verifier here, we have the tester here, which is a tester is running inside the um, cloud and I want the guarantees that my data and cloud is protected at all times. And this is about confidential computing. So this attester will generate an evidence. The verifier sends an attestation challenge and um, attester will generate an evidence and send it back to the verifier. The verifier will do the appraisal and then um, it will send over some secret or sensitive data based on its use case, whichever it is uh, dealing with. And so the generation of evidence, the appraisal of evidence uh, the question in our mind was that why do we need to have the relying party here? And we'll, so, so I will come to that. So, so there were different questions in our mind. And we found this architecture to be 
sufficiently good in order to describe the basic architecturally defined attestation. Once we know that we can replicate that for the relying party side. And that's what the SCON framework is actually based on. So that's basically coming from there. So the overall idea of the whole thing basically is that um, we have now a bit of details added to this inside the, uh, so, so think of this as the left side of the RATS architecture. What we have added there is basically this identity supplier. Um, identity supplier. Uh, okay, I think this is better. Okay. So the idea basically is that it cannot, the RATS architecture cannot define the anonymous attestation. And for that, we added this identity supplier part, which is another role which we have defined. And this is going to give the identity to the supplier, which is which we call as the attester provisioning, right on the, uh, exactly on the left. And this is something we call as the verifier provisioning, which is the endorser and the reference values provider exactly as in the RATS architecture. And then there is an appraisal policy so what we want to cover here is not only the attestation part, but also the provisioning part, which is that right from the beginning when the identity was included inside the um, hardware, which is the attester from the generation of evidence up to the appraisal. So holistically covering the, all the phases, that is the provisioning, attester and verifier provisioning, the initialization phase where um, the attester is required to um, do some setups, uh, initialization steps in order to perform before it is ready for doing the um, actual attestation protocol. And finally, we have this attestation protocol, which is this between the attester and the verifier sending the challenge, sending back the evidence and then doing the verification over that evidence. So this is the basic, basic building block, which is required in order to understand the whole attestation architecture. And we did not complicate it by having the relying party side. So once we understand this architecture in a formal way, then we can go ahead to the next stage, which is to the relying party and so on. So the contributions we made here was that it is the most detailed formal model of Intel DDX attestation, including the certificate chain right from the um, root, uh, root entity of Intel up to the workload. Uh, the steps of verifier, what is the procedure for the appraisal for the Intel TDX case, uh, doing the, um, um, the steps starting from the doing the verification of the signatures, checking the reference values, checking having that endorsements, and then checking uh, at that the, all the endorse values are also correct, uh, added to the verifier. Initialization phase, which we did not have before, we have added that as well. And there is an interesting bit on, on, on that uh, initialization phase, which is the PC element, which was missing in Intel's DCB. I will describe that. And the variable measurements. So the measurements in the formal model, in the initial formal model that we had before were not variable. So we have uh, now made it variable. So the second contribution is that we have a formal proof of insecurity of what Intel claimed as the TCB for its uh, architecture. And finally, we have for uh, ARM CCA, which is the upcoming solution of ARM. Uh, and this is interesting from a perspective that it is a composite attester as compared to the layered attester for Intel TDX. So we have for ARM CCA as well. I will mostly cover only about TDX within the limited time, but uh, we, we have a paper coming out, which is describing also the ARM CCA. So to describe it at a high level, I don't, uh, I just put in oh, oh, the, this slide to, to just to show you that there are a number of steps which are included. But from RAT's perspective, what is really important is that this local attestation is a necessary part, as you see here inside the initialization part, that it is, um, it is an important part of remote attestation. Without local attestation, you can't really talk about, uh, without local attestation, you, you can't really talk about remote attestation. It's, it, it, it's, it's really not possible. So, so the RAT's architecture says it's talking about remote attestation, but not about local attestation. That's why we include the evidence, we distinguish the local evidence versus the remote evidence, which is distinguishing whether the attestation is going on at the local level or at the remote level. Yeah, so, so these are all the steps. This is also showing which channels are secure, which are insecure. Um, at the top, you see the labels of secure and insecure, all the entities and how they are interacting with each other. And there were a number of challenges, like it was not easy to have it all uh, noted down, like the TLS protocol is um, formalized. There are 
uh, uh, RFCs beyond, uh, uh, based on that. So now we are seeing the EAT uh, TDX um, um, internet draft and so on. So other drafts which are focusing also the PSA as Yogesh showed in one of his slides. So these things are now coming up, but at the time we were doing the research, there was only some Intel documentation. And it's not really e easy to navigate through the documentation because there are a number of issues within these documentations. Many things are quite vague. It's not clear what that is meant to be inside the specifications. And this is really one example which is showing that, um, and we, we all know that these designs are very complicated. Um, uh, so the specification, for instance, the SVNs basically actually represent um, the typical way to check that is that it's greater than equal to comparison. And inside one of the specs which Intel had was this, that there is an equality check, which was really unclear why this equality check is there. So what we did was we, we posted it here inside the forum. And then the response was that actually the, out, uh, the specifications are actually outdated. So AJ, please go ahead if you have. You have four have minutes left. Okay. Are, are we, are, I'm just kind of confused. Are we reviewing a, a paper or ongoing research? Sorry? Say again? We, are we reviewing a paper or ongoing research? I don't know. I, are you asking for rats people to help on this? I'm just kind of confused what's going on. Okay. So I. Um, if you want to finish, we can sum. Okay. Yeah. Later. Yeah. So maybe just, we take it at the end. So. So th these are the properties that are related to the Intel TDX, uh, for instance, or remote attestation in general, that we have this attestation challenge evidence and the um, secrets. So once we form a formal model, we have the sanity checks that to, to see that the model is correct. And then the integrity of the evidence, that is the evidence going from the attester to verifier is not modified. It stays that all the data that is including the identity elements remain the same. Freshness, that the freshness is guaranteed. Um, and the confidentiality of the attestation related keys is maintained. Uh, attester authentication is one important property that I can ensure that it's uh, really the entity that I want to talk with. So I have um, uh, like this uh, slide to show the results of, of what we have. This is on the left what Intel claimed as its TCB, which does not include the PCE. And it also says specifically all other software is in, not entrusted by the trust domain. So what we did was we basically have this certificate chain completed um, right from the root CA up to the trust domain, which is the VM protected confidential VM. And corresponding to that, each there is a certificate here. Okay, so, so this, this is the basically the result of the verification. What we say is that basically all the properties that I described, integrity, freshness, confidentiality, and authentication do not hold for the Intel's claim TCB. And by including the PC, which is one of the entities inside that, we, we have the first three properties, but authentication still does not hold for remote attestation. And there is an interesting point there. So the, the adversary in the confidential computing model can actually instantiate a replica of the enclave or the trust domain in this case. And at the verifier side, you cannot, without additional proper properties or um, protections, you cannot actually identify which attester you are talking to. So that's one of the uh, one of the use cases inside the Kubernetes. It's difficult to actually identify that. So authentication property does not hold. Just to conclude quickly, so we have identified the gray areas and maybe this is something related to what you were asking, AJ. So, we have identified a number of gray areas inside the RATS architecture, for instance, endorsements, um, which, is re which, which was inside the definition of RATS was, uh, uh, architecture was really unclear what does it actually mean. And we can be more precise. Um, thanks a lot to Dave and others who are now pursuing this uh, work inside the endorsement uh, draft that was just discussed. And there's a need for systematic design of attestation protocols specifically. And we have a number of open questions, for instance, like how to verify the verifier coming back to the RATS architecture and more specifically what the RATS architecture can focus on or uh, can design better solutions. So this is one open question. For instance, how do I verify the verifier inside the RATS architecture? One claim which is given is that, okay, so the relying party has a small minimal verifier inside that, but the point is that if it has that verifier inside, why does it need the verifier? So why does it direct, that doesn't it directly just check that? So this is this is one open question which is um, uh, which we want rats to focus on or to have a solution to. 
how to verify the runtime configurations we we, we the, the attestation guarantees are only for the um initial time so so it's in the confidential computing use case for the initial boot time load time guarantees are there so that all the claims are related to that but there is no runtime configuration so how do we verify at the runtime and thirdly as i said the rats architecture compared to the split architecture is what i proposed uh, i described here how is the rats architecture actually better so uh, what are the scientific uh, uh, let's say uh justification for having this rats architecture how is it better than having a split architecture this is what we are exploring and would be nice to have the rats uh, uh feedback on this and how many we need you to wrap it up pretty quick sure yeah yeah i'm on the uh, just the last sentence maybe so it's trusted until we until we formally verify it and these are some of the references and the call to action inside the confidential computing consortium we are uh, building these um, artifacts for which are open source available also the paper is available um, within a few days we will have our uh, this uh, verification um, paper also out so happy to discuss or have some feedback from rats um, around this i think i'm finished so so what we have what we found at the deep so so maybe just the last thing so at deep we found there is a flaw in the formal verification which deep has done there is a there is a possibility of various working groups uh, collaboration which is the slide that i added is not here so inside the deep that can be integrated with the remote attestation that we have here there is another draft on attested tls from the tls working group um, which where these artifacts from let's say arm cc or tdx can be integrated there and there is a um uf uh, usable formal methods research group which is working on the uh, which is looking for sample problems and it's i i believe a nice sample problem for the usable formal methods to um actually think about how to how to verify these and provide feedback to that thanks okay, thank you mohammed uh sorry we didn't get to the um the the uh the, the one item having to do with the um eat media types we'll take that to the list and i think we're adjourned yep thanks everyone